up. Get ready to talk hockey. Stream from the Oilers Live Studio. Subscribe or follow today. Hey, hey, hey. It's Michael here for another edition of Oilers Live Tuesday. Happy to be back. Happy to be fully into the off season now. And uh, happy to have my uh, good friend and uh, mostly co-host, I guess, uh, Mr. Dash in the Park. Welcome back for the, what, 100th, 110th episode of Oilers Live. I think at this point you've done more than I have. 47. 47. This is actually a kind of uh, monumental uh, guest appearance for me here because number 47 passes me for the amount of episodes that I actually hosted my own show on straight off the pipe. Nice. I've been a guest on your show more than I have now hosted my own show and counting them (laughs) all up. This is my 99th podcast appearance. 99. Well, that's actually bigger than anything, right? I mean, yeah, got to be happy about that. Well, welcome. I'm happy, uh, happy to be here with you on your 99th, and I'll likely be uh, on air with you for your 100th uh, when we get there. Uh, and 199th, and, well, and uh, 999th, I and I might not be if you do uh, show for me next Tuesday, and I'm not here. Yeah, yeah, we got to talk about that, don't we? All right. This, like every other show, is brought to you by Buble, Buble. <laughs> Michael, Michael, and Michael. Yeah, this is yeah. This is what gets me through. This is what gets me through. Well, welcome uh, also, for uh, also episode Prime. number 47. Logan, oh, I'm Prime. in touch with Logan Paul. We've got uh, potential nice. sponsorship coming there as well. So. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we'll be talking sponsors uh, this upcoming season for heavy hockey. There's lots of, lots of good things happening, and we'll get there. We'll get there. Appreciate everybody uh, tuning in, seeing some people drop in on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, everybody's uh, out there. Appreciate you. Um, appreciate you tuning in and listening. We're gonna talk tonight. We're gonna do um, talk a little bit briefly about a couple NHL buyouts that have happened over the last week, or well, one that happened and one that's going to happen, which kind of makes me chuckle a little bit. We'll talk uh, the uh, Vegas Golden Knights Cup, Stanley Pardon? Cup. I'm curious. Uh, we'll get you, I'll get your opinion on that, what you think. Uh, and then we'll move into uh, just a new segment. Um, we're going to do Oilers headlines. So we'll talk, you know, who we kind of think is who's in and who's out for the Oilers going into the next year. And I've, um, and they're in the show notes. Uh, but I put together a list of Oilers headlines from writers uh, in the Oilers world. And I'll put those QR codes up as well. If you get your phones handy and ready or you want to check on YouTube, all of the uh, links should be available. You know, the usual suspects, Oilers Nation, Rashog on uh, TSN, uh, Low Tide, of course, DNB. Uh, and then a couple of our own guys here at Heavy Hockey, uh, Lotsberg and um, and Eric Friesen. A uh, couple of good articles uh, from those guys. So, uh, yeah, lots to talk about. And, I, you know, I'm always amazed this time of year, I think, really slow down on the shows. But there's always something, right? It's a year-round thing now, isn't it? What off-season? Yeah, it's not. there's no off-season. What... Um, Ken Holland's in Vernon right now, or well, probably not anymore. He's probably moved because uh, the um, draft will be coming up, right? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's uh, let's talk some buyouts. And uh, I'd love to. Um, I'll put the chat on the screen. Uh, we've got a couple people already uh, chatting. Some stranger, Dr. Gonzo, says uh, Cassian Redemption Tour. <laughs> some some stranger says Cassian Retirement Tour. Uh, so let's start with uh, Cassian today. Put on wa- waivers for purposes of being uh, bought out. Thoughts? Uh, I mean, I'll take 
the <laughs> latter over the former. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I love Cassian. It's no disrespect to him. I, just no thanks. It's not the place we're in. And uh, I mean, Cassian was a healthy scratch in Arizona where Mike Dursa took a few skates on the ice for a PTO. <laughs> was, uh, if you scratched on that lineup, I don't know. Uh, here's here's a here's a question for you. I mean, what, like there's there are. Would you believe it? As soon as it happened today, there were people out there that were suggesting the Oilers should take a run at him. The only way I take Cassian back on this team is if he gives us a million dollars back of the salary he stole from us <laughs> over the last few seasons, and we get to use that million dollars that he gives us back towards the cap. Could and have. only that. If we, <laughs> if Cassian happen. giving us a million dollars pushes the, the cap to 84.5, <laughs> he's in. Yeah. It's like, you know, putting <laughs> energy back into the into the grid, right? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah let's put money some, back into the dump cap. some harmonics back on the grid with it. Like, it's not going to work. Um, no. Liam Costin's better. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, Clem Costin is way better. I And, you know, the... Uh, I, I just it's, it just seems such a funny proposition for me to think you'd want Cassian back on the team uh, when everybody was screaming to have him go, and then he goes and he does what it the, he does exactly what everybody you know was screaming about like he had a shit season like he was a healthy scratch uh, for a good portion and you know why would you want that? I mean, if you're going to take a chance on somebody, take a chance on somebody else. Although, having said that, I mean, there's some potential that Devin Shore will be back in the lineup. And, um, you know, is Cassian a worse version of Devin Shore? Or are you you're like you're a bigger fan of Devin, Devin Shore? Devin Shore's or? a Swiss Army knife. He's, a, you mm -hmm. know, at least a jack of all trades. I mean, what does Cassian bring to the lineup anymore? Cassian's a boat anchor. Yeah. If he yeah. gets to, if he hops in his DeLorean and gets, you know, puts his mutton chops back on and we get <laughs> 2017 Wolverine, Cassian all day, every day. But that's gone, man. That was it six years gone. ago. It's gone and, and it, it went quick. <laughs> it <didn't laughs> very long. Yeah. It went yeah. about as quick as his extension. Like the yeah. minute he got extended. <laughs> everything it. slowed down heavily that was it <laughs> I, mean, right. I don't know that's probably as yeah. much cassian talk as we need to have on the show yeah oh we all bought uh, out uh, yeah i mean that's a pretty big deal thoughts on that mm -hmm. one oh where do you want me to go with it i mean um Simple and short thoughts. Uh, <laughs> 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 ah, fuck you, Canucks. Um, other than that, you know, like it's you're fixing Benning's mistake. Great. Um, you know, you're hiring Talkit. Talkit will never coach him again. Great. Um, you're paying him twenty million dollars to go away. You're still paying that contract in 2031. I don't know. Handcuff yourself, Canucks. Way to go. Like, yeah, I mean, it's you, did, it's you didn't massive. want Dylan Gunther, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> massive, massive buyout. Dude, right? like, it's ridiculous. The Canucks are so poorly run. <laughs> like, commit to a rebuild or don't, ultimately. You know what I mean? Like, you're trading out Horvat, but then you're extending JT Miller for eight years. Like, they had huge offers for JT Miller at the trade deadline, like two year last year or whatever it was, <laughs> you know, they don't make that trade for OEL. They still got Gunther in their lineup. They've still got, maybe they've got two extra first round draft picks because they don't keep trading them away. And all of a sudden they go into the deepest draft in how long they say everybody in the first rounds, a slam dunk in this draft. And there's like 10 kids from BC like, do you think the Canucks should add three first rounders this year? I don't know. I just, it's hilarious to me. Um, yeah. Thanks good on, to good on you, Canucks. Evander Kane must be jealous of that buyout. <laughs> yeah. 
hundred percent. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, look, I mean, this is, um, the only, uh, the Parise and the, um, those, there's only like a couple of buyouts that are even close, uh, to this. I one. think this was, I thought I read it was right. the third highest of all time or something. Like yeah. That. Yeah. It Parise and Suter are the two I'm thinking about, there you go. but just absolutely. I mean, you talk about the team being handcuffed, you know, oh. look at Just look at the Oilers, right. And, and how we're all cheering, you know, about some of these uh, IRs coming off and, and some of the, and, and still paying for uh, James Neal, right? Like, it's just, um, I don't know. This is, uh, this is something else. Will he be back, uh, Ekman Larson, with another team and do something? Hard to say. I mean, it's... Um, oh, I'm sure he could be an NHL defenseman, but how much do you want to make and... Where do you want to? He scored ten goals in the last three seasons. Yeah, I mean, he's, ten goals in the last three seasons. Like Derek Ryan gets ten goals a year, guaranteed. He could play. He could play for free now, though, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, sure. yeah, I get that. Right. Like you're double yeah. dipping at this point, but I don't know, man. And and look, you know, a lot of these guys, right? Like they will take a you know, a show me contract after a buyout for just that reason. Why not? Right. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you know, what do you have to lose? You take whatever somebody offers you. Right. Uh, it, there aren't going to be people lining up at the door. That's for sure. Um, I keep showing up on this yeah. show, hoping you'll pay me to go away. <laughs> yeah. 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 One day. One no day. offers yet. No, nothing yet. All right. All right. Well, I started with the buyouts because I want to rip. I didn't want to rip the Band-Aid off right away, but the Las Vegas Golden Knights won the cup. Uh, numbers, media numbers were down forty percent. On uh, was it forty-two percent? I think uh, Walsh tweeted out. You know, um, I think the only time it was worse was when uh, the Sens were in the um, in the cup final. Uh, but you've got Florida and you've got Vegas. I mean, I, I'd heard a couple of different stories. I heard some folks that were in Vegas and had no idea the cup final was even on. But then I heard from mm-hmm. a couple people that, you know, it was pretty cool to be there when the cup was on. So who knows? Who knows what's right? At the end of the day, these are not, you know, traditional markets, right? I mean, uh, you know, they're just, it's just not, and, and, Top that off, I, you know, the cup final wasn't that exciting this year. Like it wasn't, it wasn't even great hockey. Um, you know, this is, uh, so here's the thing, you know, there's a lot of Oilers fans and Canadian hockey fans that think there's some type of conspiracy against Canadian hockey teams. Uh, but when they see the numbers come back after a cup like this, you, you know, you have to, you have to be hard pressed to think that they this is what they wanted. Like it didn't. I don't. I don't think this grows the game any. Right. Like, yeah. But here, let's let's maybe skip to the part. You know, I mean, it might make yeah. potential investors for new franchises excited because yeah. you're going to win a cup in six years. Yeah. To expand to forty teams, maybe that's good for the league. But I'm being <laughs> facetious. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So we'll talk about this. I don't know if we can talk about it on air or off air, but I <laughs> I didn't even stop to read it, but I think it was on the athletic. Somebody put out there like, is it time for an Atlanta 3.0? I think it was the athletic. And God help us if the NHL goes back into Atlanta for a third straight time with the franchise that can't make it work in Phoenix. <laughs> just beating your head against the wall at this point. Wow. I think. Quebec city makes sense. You know, I don't know. Makes Kansas a ton of city sense. Makes sense. But, but there man. actually, there's, there's a lot of great. I mean, I think Houston actually Dallas, I've been to Dallas. Dallas is a hockey town. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they love the stars. They love hockey. People are into it. The Dallas Stars have done it right. They've bought just about every, they own every arena in the Dallas Fort Worth area, mm-hmm. along with Dr. Pepper. And they, um, you know, they just, you know, they facilitate the game. They grow it. 
it's uh, foundational and yeah. you know they they figured out the the process that's right? the grassroots and, yeah. yeah so you know i mean houston i think you know they they've got a a rivalry that would be automatic you know people travel with yeah you want a houston dallas rivalry or do you want a quebec city montreal rivalry bro like come oh, on. oh yeah no i look i my you know what makes the most sense Put i would love team ontario hamilton absolutely i mean i wouldn't want to live in hamilton but <laughs> i'm sure there's some coyotes that live there oh yeah oh yeah probably hey. probably i mean it's you know there are a lot of great places I think, you know, Canada, the you know, like Quebec City or Hamilton are deserving areas. And I really think Quebec City would support. Yeah, I make fun of the Atlanta 3.0, but I think Quebec City would support uh, QC 2.0 for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're filling the arena for junior hockey. Mm -hmm. And um, but let's let's talk. Did you um, did the you have a preference? Back, Patrick Waugh well, would have another job in the NHL. Yeah. I, Sorry, you, did I have a preference? Yeah, Florida or Vegas. Uh, like I said, it when McCurdy was on the show, I wanted Florida win, but Tate Chuck to separate his shoulder so that he couldn't win the cup or lift the cup. <laughs> um, turns out he broke his sternum the next game, not separated his shoulder. Uh, Pretty brutal, a, I might add. What you know they were talking about? What's brutal? Well, he had to get his brother to like put his pants on for him in the morning. Oh, yeah. has there ever been more poetic karma in hockey? Oh, yeah. Actually, there's a couple things in that series that were pretty poetic, to be honest. Taychuk getting absolutely hit by a semi truck the game after he did it to somebody and having his sternum broken, and then having Jonathan Marcheseau, who the Florida Panthers basically gave Riley Smith away to the Vegas Knights. To force them to take Marcia So in the expansion draft so that they didn't take hmm, Petrov, I think, out of memory. Like, great move there, Florida. And then yeah. that guy goes and wins a Con Smythe trophy and leads his team in scoring against you in the cup final six years later. That's amazing. He was pretty clutch. Mm -hmm. Pretty damn clutch. Yeah. You know, it's good. So was right. Well deserved by uh, Golden Knights. March, so yeah, that is um, poetic justice for sure. Uh, I at you know at the end of it, I at, I started thinking, well, I want Florida because of you know I this hatred built up Thanks, for um, for Vegas because of our series. Uh, but you know, like I'm I'm glad Vegas beat Florida because I I don't think I could handle Kachuk raising a a cup like i just don't think i could i could uh stand that and then the other piece of that is you know i've been saying since middle of the season somewhat tongue-in-cheek but that the pacific conference yeah. was uh pacific division was one of the best in the nhl um you know i think you know it, everybody would come back to me like and say well look at you know look at how many stanley cups have been won well, now the West has had the last two Stanley Cups and the Pacific Division won over <laughs> like it and every easily, single easily. every single matchup in the Western Conference was won by a Pacific Division team. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean maybe there's something maybe I'm maybe I'm not so I mean it's just that. those Nimrods that you live out east with that think that there's any argument to that ultimately <laughs> I, I heard Stoffer bring it up to somebody might have been john shannon or something too and shannon balked back at him like oh, oh no pacific division like, yeah shannon yeah. surprises me because i know he watches there, man. he watches yeah. western hockey i really feel like the challenge is you know the folks out here go to bed too early right like they don't you know sure. they just know what they read and so they've, you know, they've been told for the last 20 years that the Eastern Conference is better. So that's what they go to bed thinking before the Western Conference even starts their games. Yeah. So, you know, this is, um, there's been a change and you've got, you know, some of the best players in the league playing in the Western Conference yeah. and the best teams, the two best teams in the last two years have been in the West. Unless you go to bed at seven o'clock with visions of Marners and Matthews dancing in your head. 
<laughs> yeah, we know we know how that one plays out. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you guys uh, for tuning in. Some good comments already. Thanks, Lotsburg. Yeah. Good to see you. In fact, Lotsburg, we've got um, in this new segment, we're going to be doing Oilers headlines. And uh, we're going to talk, uh, you know, one of your articles because uh, – because it was uh, damn good, bro. It was damn good. It was damn good. But we've got a, we have got a uh, order that we're going to do things. So let's uh, let's do it in that order. I'm just going to uh, bring this up. So if you get your uh, phones out, or maybe you're watching on your phones, but if you're watching on PC and you got your phone, you can go. I'll put a um, a QR code up for each of the articles we're going to quickly discuss and lead into some other discussions and hopefully uh we get some chats going and and uh, we can uh, interact tonight first one up is uh oilers nation article by uh cam lewis uh it's his nhl notebook i think he does these ones every week oilers nation good place to go for some oilers content uh nhl notebook uh Coyotes, Coyotes, if you're in Canada, place Zach Cassian on waivers for buyout. ESPN makes a trade proposal involving the Oilers and more. Uh, so we already talked about uh, Cassian. Um, but uh, let's talk about this. I mean, let's get right into it. Um, you know, the Oilers do have to unload a contract. Uh, Cam talks about this. They've got... Um, you know, they need enough salary cap room to get uh, RFAs, Bouchard, McLeod, and Costin uh, signed to deals. And uh, Cam s- suggests the most likely candidates to become cap casualties in Edmonton this summer are Kyler, Yamamoto, Warren Fogel, and Cody Cece. So uh, let's start there. Because, uh, we, you know, we're going to talk, you know, I'm already off the show notes we're going to talk who's in who's out but we'll get right we'll get right into it and um i mean yamamoto i mean are we pretty much all in that he's uh not going to wear oilers colors next year he gone yeah hey, sir valley has been talking about this for a little while now says somebody's going to pick him up for free um you know i thought maybe i thought maybe buy out at one point, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I, I think I it's, it was out. considered. I mean, yeah. Paul had said he's considering he's looked at buyout options, and I don't know who else yeah. he'd be thinking about. Hard to say. What about Fogel? He gone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the price tag, right? On Fogel, you got to open and that up. He and, he's, and when he's got, um, well, his consistency for me is the problem. Uh, but he's got, um, I think there's folks around the league that would look at him. In fact, I think there's probably, other than maybe the price tag, there'd be more uh, that would mm-hmm. look at him than um, Yamamoto in terms of adding to their team. Played good in the playoffs for Carolina. Played good in the playoffs for the Oilers in both appearances. I thought he played really well this past playoff. I don't know. I think uh, it's, it's an easy guy to, especially in a contract year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Blue collar guy in a contract year. I like that. In the in the one thing we've always talked about is, um, you know how liked he is on the team, right? Like he seems to be what you know, player's player. Guys mm-hmm. like him. I uh, so he's you know maybe sad for some of the players to see him go, but I just don't think the Oilers can keep him. Uh, last one on uh, Cam Lewis's list here, which is one I don't think is going anywhere, is Cody Cece. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it just, you know, this one, um, I, I don't know how you, who you replace him with that, uh, you know, it depends on who you talk to, I guess. So some people would love to see CC gone, but your some thought? people, I think. Yeah. Um, some strangers in the comments, uh, you know, talking about Brett Pesci, I think that's probably the most common name that's being thrown around. Um, you know, dollar for dollar, that probably makes sense. But to me, they're almost just the same. I don't know. Like, 
Pesci doesn't have a, a history of playing against other teams' top players. Uh, CeCe's done that for three different franchises now. Uh, I just feel like if you're going to do that, you got to... You can't just get more of the same for the same amount. Um, if you're going to make that move, you've got to make sure that that three or four million dollar defenseman is a lock solid top four and really isn't CC kind of already that. Yeah. I mean, not, he's, you he's know, like top, top pairing for he's affordable top four defenseman that's serviceable in those roles that's got familiarity with nurse. I get you want to upgrade. Um, I just don't think you can, which leads me to the defenseman I really do think is going. And it's not a cap casualty. I think Broberg's gone. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's to me, it seems to be the favorite, right? Like to to go and, and not, and you're right, it's not a cap thing. And it's it's not even a capability thing. It's about being able to trade somebody with some value that can get you something else with some value. Right. And Broberg just, you know, Holland said it in the article we'll talk about, which is the interview with DNB, which mm -hmm. is uh, Broberg didn't get enough minutes and I don't see him getting it again this year. Uh, oh, I totally agree. Um, I really think when Holland addressed Broberg in that interview with Daniel Nugent Bowman, is when I was convinced Broberg was leaving. I think that's the point in time no. where he, yeah. you know, like, I don't know. We should almost read that part because it was just so telling to me the way that he. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there and we'll, and we'll, we'll read that. Once we get sure. to that article. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. But like, yeah. I think that that's the player that doesn't fit in to our equation with where we are right now. I mean, Cody is a serviceable top four defenseman at a good price to replace that. You need somebody with, for the same money. That's much better. And I don't think that person exists, let alone the deal be there to get it. Um, well, maybe, and I highlighted uh, Mayfield out of the Islanders. I wouldn't mind like something who's got some toughness, some size, some grit history of playing against other teams, best players, but He's going to want to raise. I don't know if it's more than CC money, but again, you've got to make that deal. So I, I think Broberg becomes the guy to go because ultimately I hope, I, I think the organization thinks that he should have been in a place where he could potentially be playing top pairing with nurse by now, or at least flirting with that position. And I don't think he's come even close to that. Um, no, and, and that's not necessarily his, his fault. No, part no. of it's injury, just where we are in our organization right yeah. now and yeah. needing to win now. And ultimately we can't have him and DeHarney and another younger rookie defenseman all in the top seven and expect to win a cup. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And, and um, you know, Bouchard had that problem the year of the, um, the bubble, right? Like, you know, just being here and not playing, um, people wrote him off though, uh, <laughs> at that point too, because they thought, well, he wasn't going to end up anywhere. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting, but I, I do see, um, I do see Broberg, uh, you know, potentially moving on. Uh, I, I highlighted, uh, Lotzberg's comment there, which is if you want to upgrade on CC, CC has to go. And then you need somebody that's, you know, going to be a clear upgrade at the same time. Mm -hmm. same price and yeah i mean you, you basically true. said it which is there's not you know there's yeah. not there's not anybody out there and cc's played top top pairing you know for two seasons now he's shown he's capable when you need it um, can i agree with you know, lotsberg on that one but disagree with him on his next comment no, no I mean, you're either all it, does in make, it makes a ton of sense to me and it doesn't big game doesn't mean that's the only thing you can go after with Broberg is Montour big game. Well, okay. If so you're, if you're, Flor if you're Florida, yeah. do you take Broberg for Montour? 
You've got Broberg at a lower rookie salary, which Florida's looking for. You get the high end potential. Montour is a guy you get now that can play now. So, and if you um, if you want to go uh, again, scan that QR code. It'll take you to the article we're talking about. Uh, they they quote um, another ESPN article, which is uh, Wyshynski, uh talking about a uh, you know a potential trade or just a suggested trade. Uh, that would see the Oilers end up with um, Montour by trading a first-round pick uh, and uh, and Yamamoto, actually. So uh, Broberg's not in that, but um, Montour obviously coming up in that uh, discussion. And uh, Lotsy's fighting back, but we're not going to have this as the Lotsy and Dash Hour. I'm the host here. I get to mute everybody if I want. <laughs> All right, no, guys, uh, no, that's good. I, you know, I, I think um, Montour would be a great pickup for Edmonton, but just don't see it happening. It'd be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree. I, I don't want to see Clef, uh Sorry, I don't want to see Broberg go. I don't want to give up on him this easily either. I just think that's where we are with our franchise right now. We don't have room for that Montour's player. Montour's AAV is, in his development and... is about three and a half too. I think. By the way, uh, some is, strangers yeah. and yeah. All right. But if Yamamoto's going with Broberg, there's your 3.5. That's right. Now, the uh, next one up is a TSN article, uh, or while well, it's more of a, uh, it's, it's Rishog with one of his uh, stand ups um, for TSN, uh, you know, just talking about the tweaks the Oilers are going to look to in the, in the uh, off season, adding reinforcements on forward defense will be for goals, um, or will defense will be a, a goal for the Oilers. Uh, this is, um, you know, Rashad uh, says a lot of what will what will cover in uh, Lotzi's article uh, with the uh, asymmetry. Uh, and again, I'll say if you haven't read it yet, when we get there, uh, that's heavyhockey.com. Uh, Lots he put a really good post together, uh, it, but you know this is basically reiterating. We won't spend a lot of time on this one because it reiterates a lot of the same qualities or uh, discussion points that um, Holland brings up in his interview with the NB. Uh, anything out of that video that um, was really groundbreaking? I don't know. Watch the video. Rashad's good. I mean, he knows. He knows his stuff. He's got a uh, pretty good inside edge on in what's happening. Um, but again, a lot of the same, same stuff there. Let's go to, um, let's move on from that one. Unless you got anything to say on that one. No, he's just clearly reading Lotzberg's articles and <laughs> That's right. he's just doing videos on them. He's doing taking them out as his own. <laughs> Thank you. It was clear. It was clear. Uh, let's talk, uh, you know, favorite of the show and uh, favorite of Oilers fans all over uh, is low tide. Uh, one of the things I love about low tide and uh, sad Tune uh, in next that week. we can't, uh, yeah, sad that we can't hear them um, uh, every day anymore. Uh, but uh, you know, I always love because he low tide does this thing. And if, if any of you have a subscription to the athletic, you can, um, uh, scan there, you'll uh, get taken to the article. You need a subscription, of course, to read it. I, I'll be honest. I only get the subscription for Low Tide. Well, and DNB is pretty good too. Uh, but if it was, if Low Tide wasn't on there, I probably wouldn't even get it. Totally. And, agree. and you know, the thing that I love about him is he does these type articles. So this one is um, five quality Edmonton Oilers trade targets for low budget off season. And you won't find these trade targets on anybody else's list. Right. Like, no. you know what I mean? Like he just, he thinks uh, out of the, out of the box, he seems to understand every player in the league. He, you know, he, he's, he looks at it from an analytics point of view, but he looks at it from every other point of view. Uh, and he's just um, like, he's a, he's a genius when it comes to this stuff. And he, and he's, you know, he's picked up things last year. He asked about Jordan Dumay, uh, who played for the Mooseheads and, and mm-hmm. um, is now the, uh, 
career all-time uh, Halifax Mooseheads point scorer, uh, led the league in the queue in points this year, uh, was absolutely outstanding. And he asked, you know, should the Oilers draft him? Nobody else was even talking about Jordan Dumais. Uh, and, uh, but low tide was, you know. Low tide works his ass off. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Gonzo says he puts in a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, if you got a chance and you have a, a subscription, check out this one. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the trade targets. We'll talk about each one. Uh, Niels Hoglander uh, playing for the um, uh, Canucks, Arthur Kaliev uh, for the Kings, Matthew Phillips, which is a name I think you'll probably hear more about um, as things go on. As some people probably speculate about him. Uh, he's uh, with the Flames or was with the Flames. Philip Tomasino, who was a guy I hadn't thought about until I read this article, and I, I actually really love that idea. Uh, Igor yeah. Sokolov uh, for the Senators, Alex Turcotte again for the Kings. Uh, so those are some of the trade targets uh, that he has. Uh, any names, uh, you know, for me, the one that, that stuck out is Tomasino. Like when he's, you know, he's one of those guys that uh, he could be like a, uh, you know, a different, different type of player, but he's, he could be one of those guys like a clean cost and that comes in and makes immediate difference, different type of player, uh, but yeah, different, yeah, different type of player, but the same kind but of that type of difference. Player, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, any names in there that uh, really uh, struck, struck you? It had the same effect on me. Uh, I thought Tomasino was something that jumped out at me. Um, I just don't see that as being realistic. I don't understand how or why Nashville would, in, especially in the state that they're in as a franchise would not yeah. want to keep going with him. Um, as well as uh, I do believe he was developed under trots who's now coming back. So um, I don't see that as ultimately realistic. Uh, I also didn't think Kaliev was ultimately realistic. I don't understand why, you know, if he's inconsistent for the Kings, then that's, that's the team we're trying to beat. So you know, I don't. I don't want any leftovers from Vegas or or the, or LA. Like those are the teams we're battling, and that's yeah. And if, and if LA has to any inkling that he could turn his uh, game around, right? Like there's yeah. no way he's coming to Edmonton. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's no. just no. Phillips is probably the most yeah. realistic on there. Uh, Turcotte yeah. was maybe the one that actually tweaked me the most, and that's just because. If Holland's got to go out and get six scratch tickets, you know, for nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars each, then that's probably the one that has the biggest potential to actually pay off, off big money, right? Like the rest of those scratch tickets, if they cost a million dollars, you might you might win one point two million, but with Turcotte, you might actually win three or four million. You know, like that's a it's a guy that went very highly overall, had a ton of potential. Whether it's still there, who knows? But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, you know, all of this to say, I, like, I love uh, when Low Tide puts out a, a list like mm -hmm. this. Like he know, you know, he he says in there. Look, he says Tomasino's unlikely. You know, he's got nothing to say that that could happen. But if it does, um, mm -hmm. you know, it should be a priority. And uh, I tend to agree with him on on most of his stuff, and and uh, love love having to read. And you know, a lot of times he gets me thinking about players I wouldn't otherwise think about. You know, yeah, yeah, well, uh, sure. yeah. And I and I love that about him. A lot of respect for uh, Mr. Low Tide, and we'll get him on the show uh, sometime sooner than later, which uh, will always be fun. He's always a fun guy to talk to. Uh, let's move on to. Probably the biggest article, uh, the most telling article um, that's uh, in here. That in fact, the next two are both uh, Daniel Nugent Bowman, again another writer for the Athletic. I've changed the QR code. If you want to scan that one, uh, you can read this one, titled uh, "Oilers GM Ken Holland on Salary Cap Space, Steve Steos, and 2023 NHL Draft and More Q and A." So DNB uh, sat down with Ken Holland and Vernon, 
and put the uh, the list uh, or the uh, interview edited, of course, uh, onto uh, the athletic. Uh, talked, uh, you know, about everything from uh, Derek Ryan. Steve Steos was in there. Um, you know how he felt about the uh, Stanley Cup. Uh, you know what's the what's the number one thing you took uh, from this article? And do you have first? You have it in front of you, just so you can maybe if if you want to read part of it um, for the folks that are listening uh, that you think um, you know kind of struck you the most. Struck me the most. <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier. Uh, this was the article that made me believe Broberg is gone. Um, oh, I think there was a lot of things to pop out on this. Um, you know, Ryan getting re-signed, uh, the extra year was clearly the same strategy Holland's been using, um, since he got here using term instead of dollar. Um, I don't hate it. There's a lot of people clamoring about that second year, whatever he, he apparently was spoken to that he could end up in the AHL and he knows that as well as maybe he's so popular in the room. Maybe it's a Keith deal. Maybe he just retires. Maybe it's Mike Smith deal. You're just giving him that extra year so that, you know, going to retirement a little more comfortable. So um, I'm sure Derek Ryan's happy to get 1.8 million instead of the 1 million that he could have got on a one-year contract anywhere else. Uh, Steos. <clears throat> yeah. You know what? Like what did Holland say? Basically, Guys come and guys go. Iserman left my organization. Babcock left my organization. It's tough to hold them back if they're that good. And I don't know. He didn't say it, but if you love them, set them free. And if they love you, maybe they'll come back like Iserman did, right? So um, if Steos wants to be in Edmonton and they think that he's the perfect guy, then hang on a little bit. I think probably there's other people within the organization that are probably in line for a promotion as well. And this yeah. is probably what I took most about this. There's not any one thing. I mean, you talk about, um, you know, you talk about the uh, taking this as the reason why you might think Broberg's gone. And I took, there's one paragraph in there, in there where he talks about, we're, you know, he says, we're set in goal. I look at defense. Obviously, there's Nurse, there's mm -hmm. Cody Cece, there's Ekholm and Bush, and there's Brett Kulak. Vinny DeHarnay played really good in the regular season. Some tough moments in the L.A. series, but he settled down. Anyway, mm -hmm. he doesn't even talk about Broberg there. So he's, you know. But what did he say by omission? Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, and, and that's that. That's what I took from this article all like straight through it is mm -hmm. there were a lot of things he didn't say that you know you could read a lot into and the steos thing i mean i you know that's exactly what i took from it which is you know yeah he's he's likely gone uh he's a good guy but you know there's a good chance you know we might see him again uh with the oilers right you know um, for sure you know and and but but then he you know he does set out there he's you know like steos is with them right now right like he's mm -hmm. there so he's you know, there's obviously been some chats, right, uh, mm -hmm. that he could go um, to Ottawa, and that's um, that's the way it is. Um, I like what he had to say. One of the things that I liked about Holland, and I go through this like roller coaster with Holland, where sometimes I wonder what he's thinking, and and then a lot of times I go to this. He's a pretty shrewd guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he and he does he doesn't move fast on anything, but he does things. Uh, you know, with a lot of thought. And I like the way he talks about, look, like all of these teams, Tampa Bay, Colorado, Vegas, they all finished in the top quarter of the league multiple mm -hmm. times, right? This is not about, you know, one and done, right? This is about mm -hmm. building a team that's going to compete every year. And, and what did he say? He said, um, you know, we've always been close and never won it, but to win it, you've got to be close. That was a s super right. statement. Super yeah. statement. Yeah, Loved it. exactly. And and so, look, uh, like I think he's got the right thought process in mind. He's obviously stuck by, you know, cap problems. He talks about that. So if you got a chance, again, you can scan that QR code, read this one on The Athletic. Um, you know, it's worth the read. It's quick read. 
you know, just a couple, probably what half dozen questions and answers. Uh, yeah. He talks about Bouchard in there. Um, and, and you know what, well, maybe with that's a good transition, uh, unless you got anything more about that, um, Holland article, but a good transition to the next, um, next article. I think yeah. I do. I, I think a lot of that came out of there. I think we wouldn't even be doing it justice to blow over it. Um, step by step, I think every single question and answer in there told a story of some kind, like you said, whether it was by omission and reading between the lines or whether it was completely straight up honest, um, you know, in talking about where, you know, we've got our five of our top six set, you know, the only one that was in and out of the top six was Yamamoto. He, he said his name <laughs> right there, right? I think like that was a big hint. Um, what it did is give me confidence. And I think what, you know, you said Holland doesn't move on anything quickly. I also think that part of, of not moving on anything quickly is the fact that no stone goes unturned. He's very meticulous about, you know, not just well thought out, but very meticulous. I think he goes through every single one of his assistant GMs for advice. I think he goes to the players for advice. He goes to the coach for advice. He goes to a peer group for advice. He takes all that advice and he comes up with the, the best plan possible. And, and it's because he's had all those conversations. He goes to the players. He goes to the agents. He's he's had every conversation six six ways from Sunday before the decision's ever made. And this article kind of outlines that a little bit again because in the Steos part, look at the risks he's taking. Pardon me. Oh, in the Steos part, he talks about all the folks in your uh, yeah 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 for sure. I think that's part yeah. of it. But I think there's two risks that that article outlines and one of them is that he's doesn't think that he needs to sign Bouchard before July 1st. Yeah. Meaning that he could expose him to an offer sheet and didn't seem to care whatsoever. And the other thing is that he's going to qualify Clint Costin, which yeah. if you qualify Clint Costin, now he can go to arbitration. And if he goes to arbitration, he's going to get double his salary, maybe more. So you're taking the risk that either one of those things could happen but you know why it isn't a risk to Ken Holland, Michael? Because he's done his goddamn homework. He's already talked to the agent. He's already talked to the player. He knows damn well that if Bouchard gets an offer shoot, he's not signing it. Why is yeah. the guy going to pass up being the quarterback for the best team, the best quarterback, sorry, the best power play in the history of hockey? Like, as an offensive defenseman, what what else do you want? That's, well, that's and, and you look at is it not? a guy like, like Bouchard, right? Is he, you know is he is he Barry right like on the Oilers power play like is he a guy that you know is an offensive juggernaut because he's on the <laughs> with the best guys in the world on the power play like that's a oh. that's a chance you take if you give him the kind of offer sheet that he'd want to sign Barry was incredible for the abs too let's not take that away yeah yeah him. but he you know what I mean like power play with Landis yeah. and McKinnon that look pretty damn good too again Two of the <laughs> I know yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying yeah. you gotta earn your place to be there. Yeah, I'm yeah. not I don't want to take that away from Barry. Um the other part, you know, letting Costin get qualified, you know, that's because he's done his it's homework. Risk, he's talked right? to Clean. He's he's you know, he knows that Clean wants to come back. He's looking at the Clean Costin across the boardroom table that took that Calgary Flames jersey off of a guy at the photo event, right? Like he, he knows Clean <laughs> wants to be back and that's why he's willing to take those risks. And yeah, to, to Holland's, to your, to out both of our points, I think Holland's done his homework. And um, <clears throat> the Broberg thing, again, you, you mentioned part of it, but, you know, his words exactly here, when he talks about, um, you know, um, oh, I went too far. I lost it. Uh, I talked to Woodcroft about him. I believe Jay Woodcroft, Dave Manson, and I all think he has the potential to be a top four guy. Potential. Reading between the lines. Now saying all that, you've got to play. To play better, you've got to... Uh, in saying all that, you've got to play. To play better, you've got to play. When you've got Darnell Nurse on the left side, Eckholm and Kulak, they're pros. That's a dilemma. So he just said he's not playing the left side. Yeah. I don't yeah. really have an answer for you right now. That's what I've got to sort out in the next couple of weeks. But being in the seven hole, playing five minutes, 
I don't know how that's doing much for his development and growth as a player. He needs to play 15 or 20 minutes, which he just said isn't going to happen. That's the downside. The upside is it sounds like we've got some pretty good defense. Those aren't bad problems. We've got good problems. Over 82 games, you probably need seven defensemen, and everybody gets their ice time, but he needs to get into the lineup every night. He needs to play every night and feel important, and that's how young people grow. I really feel good about our left side D. He can play right, but I think he's most comfortable on the left. Broberg's development and growth weighs on my mind on a regular basis. Hence... <laughs> he's losing sleep over why he has to trade the guy that he took over Zegers. Well, and absolutely he'd lose sleep. Over he's gone, him. man. He's gone. Yeah. That, that yeah. absolutely told it to me. There's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a telling, uh, piece right there. It's telling in, in who he, that he left out Broberg when he talked about who his top six were, uh, you know, everything in this article, you know, is about, where Broberg fits and, and, you know, it's not, you can tell in, in how he talks, he, he thinks there's potential for sure. Uh, but that's, you know, that's good. Like if you're going to trade a guy and you honestly believe he's got potential, then at least you're not going to give him away. Right. Mm -hmm. Or at least yeah, you, you hope that he doesn't. So, um, look, we'll, we'll find out soon enough, I guess. Uh, and, and the clean cost and piece, uh, you know, he didn't talk, they didn't talk much about that other than to say they've had some chats. We'll see where it goes. Some stranger says he's asking Broberg to step up. That's how I read that. And that could be that too, right? Could be that too. Um, lots, he says, uh, Broberg's in Baco, maybe goes to Baco waivers exempt. Nemo is 25 and is not waivers exempt. He can play us the seven minutes a night in the seven slot. Yeah, I mean, there's some interesting things. I, you know, I'm I'm kind of with you, Dash, but uh, obviously, um, you know, there's there are other potentials. We'll see what happens. He did, you know, he mentioned he'd still like to upgrade his defense. Mm -hmm. So somebody's got to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it any one of those? folks that he'd already kind of mentioned and and you know i always i love this discussion because he says we need to upgrade our defense but then you know in that same broberg piece he says well you know it's a good problem to have we got pretty good defense <laughs> well what is it right do you need to upgrade right. or you got good defense that's right uh but the the reality and, and most of us i think could agree is um you know this is a team that now has at home for a full season I hadn't thought about the the piece that um, uh, DNB brings up, which is, you know, the Oilers didn't lose anybody on D last year. Like everybody played, right? You know, for you know, good part of the season. Well, I think CC uh, was injured yeah. for a good part of the season. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, come yep. up. Uh, next one. Uh, and, you know, we'll talk a lot about these things we just finished talking about. But uh, again, uh, Daniel Nugent Bowman. Uh, also, I think an underrated. Uh, I, I mean, lots of people know him, but I think if you don't subscribe to The Athletic, you probably don't mm -hmm. get enough DNB uh, content. And, um, you know, and, and so I'm not telling you to subscribe to The Athletic uh or not um but uh certainly for low tide and dnb uh it's it's worthwhile there's um and i certainly am not uh promoting them or getting sponsored by them but just make sure you pay the right price because there's um usually some cheap cheaper like 12 dollar a year options in other words don't pay more than a buck a month <laughs> or you're overpaying all right uh, next uh, article, and again, it's up on the QR code. Uh, this is by Daniel Nugent Bowman uh, for The Athletic. Again, what I'm hearing about the Oilers 2.0, Evan Bouchard offer sheet, question mark, Clem Costin to KHL, question mark. Um, so discussion here is Bouchard and an offer sheet, and then Costin and the KHL appeal. And then some discussion on Ryan and the second year. 
and then CC and the status quo. So all of these things we've talked about uh, tonight, probably the one that, um, you know, uh, well, two, two that we'll talk about right now, uh, the Bouchard offer sheet. I mean, what, you know, you think this is a possibility? Not even close. I mean, you know, this is this is one of those cases where offer sheets do happen. I mean, every time there's discussion about offer sheets, everybody says, ah, they never happen, you know, or they seldom happen. The thing with this one is like, A, how damaging it would be to the Oilers, right? Like, I don't know that they'd have or could find somebody who could fill into Bouchard's spot on the power play with the same effect. Maybe. I mean, you, I mean you've got, obviously, you've got Dreisaitl and McDavid, and, and they could probably prop me up on the, on the power play. On tour, had 73 points last year. Yeah, 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 that's fair. Uh, but this would be, you know, this is one of those where if it does happen, um, the Oilers can't do anything. Like they just, they just won't have the space. And so it's, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a for sure, like it's almost a, a guarantee that they'll be, Bouchard would be gone. And so that's, that's the biggest fear. But, you know, to your point, Holland didn't seem to care. Like he just, seem to think that it wasn't going to happen. Is it irresponsible? I think a touch if they don't get it done before July 1st. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's, it's just flapping in the wind. It's off-season talk to be off-season talk. There's not... A... Dude, if you are Evan Bouchard and you're looking at quarterbacking, the best power play in the history of hockey... In order to be able to set up your next contract, why the fuck would you go to any other team? What team is going to offer sheet them? Who? You're going to go to Philly? Like, it doesn't make sense, man. There's no chance. The thing about an offer sheet is the other guy has to sign it too. You can throw as many offer sheets as you can throw 31 offer sheets at Bouchard. He isn't going to sign any of them. End of story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it, it depends. Brian Burke right? isn't in like, the league. He's not looking to take Kevin Lowe out to a barn fight and get revenge <laughs> yeah, on yeah. Dustin Penner. Like, there's no GM that's looking to hurt the Oilers if it's not going to benefit their team. Like, and there's nobody then that's going to be somebody in our division who's going to do that. Canucks spent all their money on buying out OEL. Yeah, there's not a lot of guys with the kind of room that it'll take. I don't think it's realistic, nor do I think Clem going to the KHL is realistic for almost the exact same reason. If you can play third or fourth line on spot duty with Dreisaitl and McDavid every once in a while to set up the rest of your NHL career, which 12 months ago was potentially non-existent, now all of a sudden you got your shot and you love it there, and you fit in, and the city loves you, and you have arb rights? You're not going back to the KHL. It's a bunch of blab. Yeah. I, you know. Uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, though, like as much as I, I agree with you, money talks a lot. Right? And, you know, any offer sheet that's been ever signed has been for a lot of money. Right? Dustin Penner knew he was never going to get $27 million playing for the Ducks. Yeah. That's it. It is. <laughs> you're right. It is about yeah. money and money talks. So do you yeah. want to take a, a, a six and a half million dollar contract over eight years, you know, for 50 million or whatever from Philly? Or do you want to bridge yourself for four and then sign nine times eight or nine and a half times eight in, in the team that has McDavid and dry and is likely going to win a cup or two. Like it, it's not even close. The money's money talks. And yeah, the, the money 
is in Edmonton. Yeah, I, I mean, you may be right. I, I still think it's a risk, and uh, hopefully, it's it's not one that anybody acts on. I just think it's you know s- silly to take it that far if you can avoid it. Uh, but you know, you're you're right. There, there's benefit to him, obviously. Uh, you know, doing a bridge deal and and signing later. Uh, and you know, if you're talking about winning, then you know, he's got a good shot at it here, leaving a legacy, uh, being a player that, you know, everybody remembers as being on the top power play for, you know, potentially the next three, four, four years, right? Playing with his friends. Uh, Yeah, playing with his friends, playing with the guys that he knows. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. A hundred percent agree on all those points. I still think money talks. I think that, you know, if, if Kleem, Somebody in the KHL says, and, and only with Clean, like only with, uh, you know, a Russian player, right? Um, you know, some of them want to be home, right? And that, um, you know, money and being back back home, like that's that's kind of, um, you know, the only reason you'd have any concern. And and you know, he Holland didn't say much in the interview with DNB other than to say that he, you know, had, had talked to him. Um, but there's no, like, I just, I don't know in what world he doesn't get a raise. He's talked to him. That's right. all. It, yeah. Of course he's going to get a raise, but he can get a 1.5, right? Yeah. Instead of going there's to Arb and getting two or 2.2. Right? Yeah. Well, sure. But you want clean cost in a 1.5. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we'll see, right? I mean, that's uh, you know, I I think I think you're. I'm not suggesting you're wrong about that. I I tend to agree with both your points on that. I'm just saying that, you know, um, look, you know, if you're gonna bet on long shots, like that's one I'd bet on, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I I bet on a uh, claim to khl if you know the odds were right and i'd bet on a uh, offer sheet to bouchard if the odds were right so you know the, him frankly, signing the an offer the day, sheet these, is the... these guys play hockey for you know could be 10 years could be you know that it's not a lot oh of time, sure right? yeah like, that, and that's what you know that's what the it's... decision comes down to for yeah. bouchard i mean clean sure clean clean's gonna get four four sheets american to play in the KHL for the next three years. Yeah. Yeah. He might take his 12 mil and have a fun life in Russia. Um, Bouchard, man, there's, there's a better chance of Josh Bolton's hair growing back than there is. a. I mean, the, the thing I could see with Costa though, is, you know, he comes back to the team and, uh, you know, depending on what his agent says, uh, who's his agent, uh, the- Theophanus, was with TMI. So uh, Panarin, Bobrovsky, all Russians, right? Tarasenko, Varlamov. You know, like you're you're this guy that um, yeah came from nowhere. You got a chance with the Oilers. Uh, you had a good season. You got it. You're you're going to be given the same chance you were last year, and potentially have a better season. Be utilized mm-hmm. appropriately. Uh, too. Yeah, like, um, you know, I could see that being a real plus. I, I don't look. I'm not. I, I don't disagree with you. I don't think Costin's going anywhere, and I don't think Bouchard's going anywhere. Do I, I think they exactly should come out of nowhere? Yeah, it's a first round pick. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Here's the thing: is is uh, I, I just think. You know, if you got a chance to, um, you got a chance to uh, uh, play here one more year, get the same kind of uh, same kind of chance, if not a little bit better, right? It's maybe you know the odd time being thrown onto the second line, right? Uh, you're going to blow those numbers out, I think. Like he's going to do as well, if not better, and and prove himself as a player in the league and. And, um, you know, go into next season uh, with a, a real shot at, uh, like, uh, you know, he's only going to sign them one year, I think, if he if he sticks around. Um, 
Kelly at Beer League Heroes uh, says, uh, I'd argue if Clem didn't play for Edmonton next year, they wouldn't be as bad off as fans think. Although, I, you know, Kelly, I, I don't think claims to be all and end all. Anyway, I'm just it's more about yeah. whether or not he signs with Edmonton. Um, would you rather have him at two million or Bugstad or Taze at the same price? Uh, I'd rather him than Bugstad, although I really like Bugstad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I just think he offers a little bit more. And, uh, you know, shoot, showed a little bit more than Bugstad did. I thought Bugstad was a good pickup. Uh, I get where Kelly's going with that. I just, um, hmm. and I love Kelly, so I don't want to argue with him. But ultimately, you're comparing apples and oranges. Um, would I rather have Clean Costin, who's a 10 to 15 goal scorer, who will fight 7 to 10 times a year, who will keep other teams at bay, who will hit and play a fourth or third line role really well when he's not scoring and still contribute over Bugstad. Yeah, I would. Bugstad's okay. He's, you know, same amount of goals. He's a big body. Probably doesn't use it well enough. Did okay in that one game when he went 10-0 and on the draw, but isn't a historically great face-off guy. Um, kills penalties. Clem's not going to do that for you. Uh, Taves, sure. If Taves is up to Edmonton, I guess. He's going to take some convincing from his good buddy Keith. But well, and the, and the talk still is right. Like there is there is discussion around Oilers and Taves, right? But you know, there's there's question marks on his health, right? Like yeah. that's not a guarantee. I don't, yeah. I'd call that more, and I know it's probably meant because of the price, but that's probably big game hunting ultimately as to what Lotsey was saying earlier. And I know it's a fourth line player potentially. If look, if Taves is willing to come for a million a year, do it all day, every day. If he's willing to come for 1.5, do it all day, every day. Uh, I don't think he really is going to come or would want to come. If he does, fine. Like what did Taves had a pretty decent resurgence last year. Um, I, the only thing I don't see is, in is the, the Oilers six, but... having the discussion if there's not some potential that they can make it work. But again, we're talking about two guys that play center. Costin's a winger, right? Like Taves is fourth line and leadership. Like if he, yeah, if he when Taves can play the wing, I'm sure or something. But why would you when he's sixty percent in the draws or whatever, right? Or maybe he does it like Derek Ryan, where he takes faceoffs and then goes and plays the wing after, but. Uh, yeah, fair question, Kelly, and I get where you're going with it. Uh, there's better ways. Not, sorry, there's not better ways. There's equal ways to spend $1.5 million on a bottom six player and probably come out just as fine. I get it. Like if we had Yanmark instead of Costin, you know, that's not the difference between a cup. I just love that Costin is a bit of a unicorn. Like there's just so few guys that can fight and score and keep the other team honest in scrums like that. So I, I honestly, I, yeah, I think I would take Austin over the well, and Costin's just for the role that he plays. He's likable, like Pugliarvi, <laughs> you know, like that same kind of likable attitude. But he performs mm-hmm. like he, you know, he had some, put some numbers down, and he, you know, he does all of the things that you were kind of hoping Pugliarvi would grow into, and never did. And and you got more out of Costin. Yeah, uh, you know, that's just the just the way it worked, uh, and. I can't believe I brought up Pooley RV on this show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the, uh, let's move on. Well, let's, uh, you know, last, last question is CC. I mean, we, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but um, I, I just can't in no world do I see CC moving on from the Oilers. We, you know, we've talked about Froberg. We talked about CC having to move. Montour is probably the only real option in that space. Uh, yeah. Um, although the about Montour Montour is too, right? Yeah. I mean, you use that 3.5 to get Montour and then how do you re-sign McLeod and how do you re-sign, but you still need to, that you gotta have something that has to come from somewhere. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and well, and you know, lots of you said it, which is you can't, um, you know, you can't sign somebody else without you know cc leaving right like cc well we got five million in cap space and seven million worth of players to resign 
Like uh, legitimately, not Bubstad. Like with, you know, we probably owe Ryan McLeod some money for taking a discount last year. And yeah, you know, McLeod's you can't go in get that. Get uh, tour and, you know, pay all those guys as well. So McLeod's in that list uh, for sure. Uh, let's talk about this um, next one. And, and I think we've been lucky here at Heavy Hockey to have Lotsburg uh, putting articles, articles together. Uh, he is our uh, our way on a budget, low tide. He kind of he puts his stuff uh, together, with puts a lot of thought into it, I think, and um, comes up with some stuff. And last year, there were a couple of times where we um, had some fun with uh, Lotsy, and he turned out to be 100% dead on. Um, nobody else saw it. He he wrote some things that were ahead of you know the other guys, uh, and so you know I I've started to um, really pay attention uh, you know to uh, some of the things and and uh, just all of that to say lots. He keep up keep doing the good work. Uh, QR codes uh, on the top there if you want to scan that article is uh, positional asymmetry on the Oilers. Uh, this is uh, part one, and this is the wingers. And so if you scan that, you'll get there. Uh, you know, Lotsy talks about uh, the talent uh, with the Oilers, but, um, you know, in his estimation, there's posi- positional asymm- asymmetry. And so the depth chart, and he, did, he didn't do it from a, like not from a real depth chart, but from a, you know, who plays left wing, who plays center, who plays right wing sort of scenario and it's clear you know this Oilers team is lopsided on the left side and needs some right-handed assets uh, obviously some guys are you know going to go um, Yamamoto's more than likely gone some guys can play uh, both sides um, but with Yamamoto gone I mean that's even he's got him up on the right-hand side <laughs> as well uh, this team's like this is a major challenge. Yeah, for the Oilers. It's only one right-handed shooting winger left. Yeah, and and so I, you know, I think the the interesting thing is like all of these guys we're talking about, you know, um, you know, Broberg and and um, you know, there's still guys like Lavoie Le, needs to be uh, signed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we you know we haven't we just the Oilers are in this position where yeah, there's nobody to put on the right side and there's no money to put anybody there unless you get, you know, bonus deals. Uh, you know, what's the, what are they going to do? I mean, this is, this may be in my mind outside of um, like, I don't even think when I think about this team, I, I, I don't think as much about the defense as I think about this right side and the forwards. Mm -hmm. You know, even like, you know, you're going to be all right with Kane and McDavid, but who, you know, who do you play there? And then you've got, uh, you know, you've, you've got really one, the way it's set up right now, Nuge is playing in the, in the top two, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And um, you know, I think when this team is best, is uh, when you can get the depth down to the third line with Nuge playing on the third line when they're at their best. So, what's the you know what can they do? How can they uh, adjust to uh, to go for that? Uh, a lot of people are talking about Connor Brown, right? And that'll be one of the articles we talk about. But is that why that name's coming up more often? You know, is he, you know, is this legit? Is is he the guy that the Oilers need? Uh, and, and is that enough, right? Is that, you know, going to be enough? When you look at this depth from a left to right, there's nobody on the right hand side. Assuming Yamo's gone. And you got Ryan on the right hand side. He's the other guy, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, you, you know, you need Ryan at center half the time. To be effective. No, I, he doesn't play center. He just takes face Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you, uh, you know, what do you do in this instance, right? So you, you got, 
you know, some. I mean, you signed Ryan as your fourth line winger, so he's staying there. Yeah. Hyman goes up to play a right wing. He has to. But no you choice, can't have Kane right? and Hyman and Nuge and now you know you've got I mean, Nuge so. though has to drop has to move up to the second line, right? You need mm-hmm. like this team That's needs okay, though. though some bottom six like they need to keep the the puck out of the net in the bottom six, but they've got to get some scoring. Yeah, right. Like they have to get some scoring out of the bottom six. Uh, Kelly says, is Brown really going to sign as cheap as some of the media are saying he might? 1 million plus incentives. I've heard it's already done. And at 12 a.m. on July 1st, it'll be announced. Yeah. Literally already on paper, the ink's dry. Connor Brown can't wait to be here. He wanted to be here last time. He got traded to Washington instead. Now he's a free agent. He shares an agent with Connor McDavid. He used to be on Connor McDavid's line in Erie. They're buddies from way back. He can live in Connor McDavid's basement and, you know, take his girlfriend's dog for walks and, and whatever the hell needs to happen. But yeah, I think like <clears throat> it's pretty evident we need right wingers. There's not any big game right wingers we can afford or go after so like there's tarasenko there's patcheretti there's all those guys are not an option so ultimately if you're going to look at the next tier or even the next tier after that i think connor brown's a slam dunk for the oilers i think he's got the relationship with our captain he's a elite penalty killer which is something that we are in need of um especially with, you know, Bugstad and players like that potentially going and a lot more youth filling in our lineup. You know, you mentioned Lavoie, you mentioned, or you didn't mention, but Holloway is going to probably have to find a spot. Um, Don't sleep on Grooby. Um, I think there's some opportunity there too. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Oilers obviously uh, picked him up because they saw something. Right. That, um, and you know, he's a you know, proven leader, right? Well, uh, you know, I went for lunch with a scout last yeah. week, yeah. right? And that scout told me that Gruby was a steal, it's like absolute steal. Like every team in the league checked in, and he was shocked that the best pick they could get was a fifth. He said that the New York Rangers are run by the Massachusetts Old Boys Club. You know, you look at the history, you know, they're recycling Lava Laviolette again. It's just nothing but guys from Boston, guys from Boston, guys from Boston. Jury's been there for so long, what, for 10 years now. He's been going on all Boston. That scout told me that if Gruby was a kid from Boston College, He'd already he'd already be on that team. Yeah, it's a matter of that he's a Western guy. That there's not a lot of Western scouts. That he had a smidgens of criticism on his skating and being in shape. And that scout told me that sometimes those things just stick with a player. And once they're stuck, you just you can't shake that reputation. You can't shake that whatever. Uh, he also mentioned to me that Gruby was going back home in the off season and that the Rangers potentially didn't see it as enough of a commitment to uh, not be living out on the East coast in, yeah. in the off season. So all those things put together, I think it was maybe a miss by the Rangers and a, and a steal for the Oilers. And well, and we talked, you know, we talked about this last sources week. that he may make the team this year with uh, Bruce, which is, um, you know, the Red Deer Rebels are, have a hell of an organization, right? Like, you know, you can, there's certain organizations. The captain and, for three years in junior yeah. on a Sutter team. Yeah. You're oozing character. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's, you got named that's captain thing, at 17 right? years yeah. old by Sutter. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, and that's, that's what I look at, right? Like, is, is there just some organizations that you have a lot of trust in? And if uh, and if a guy does well 
in that organization in the CHL, then I think, you know, that means something. Um, and to come from Red Deer, uh, you know, obviously the Oilers have, have watched him play right they've you know they would know better than anybody you know the rebels what the rebels have and and um so they you know it was clear this was an easy choice for them we'll see i mean i whether he can make the transition right away though is you know yet to be seen and and that's you know what the oilers need but the oilers you know it could be they um i just do they rush anybody that <laughs> right like just to get uh fill the roster i mean that would be um he'd fit the bill you know a right-handed guy leader you know wants to play he's at home he'll feel at home yeah i mean uh, you know what you said and i remember you saying that is he's a steal uh that'd be great That'd be great. I think the Oilers, uh, the Oilers need that. They need something, obviously, and we've we've talked about that. They need something akin to the cost and pickup from last year. Some, you know, some surprises, if you will, and and maybe not surprises. I think. Hey, look, Holland has done, and you talked about it earlier, like just talking to everybody and using. He talked about it in his interview with DNB, which is. He's got this great team surrounding him, right? And, uh, you know, they're out there, they're meeting, they're talking about these guys, they're talking about guys like Grube, and, you know, they know what they have, and they'll find a way to, to put this team together. And you still have, you know, no matter how we look at it, we still have, you know, uh, McDavid, Dreisaitl, Nuge, and Kane <laughs> on this team. Like, you know, whoever you put on those, you know, right, right wings with those guys, really, and I'm not even including Hyman in that mix. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean. so whoever you put on the right wing there uh, is going to do all right. Right. Um, you know, you, you talk about, you know, pairing guys up and then finding somebody who works well with them. You know, so it, like while it matters that they get somebody on the right wing, uh, they can sort of patch this team up until the right point in the year where they need to do other things. What I do like, and I, you know, go to that interview and he's talking about he'd like to shore up on the defense. I Having Ekholm for a full season is going to make all the difference in the world. Having Ekholm oh, play, assuming Bouchard's back, having Ekholm and Bouchard on that uh, playing together for a full season will make all the difference in the world. Having DeHarnay as an experienced player coming into the league now will make all the difference in the world. So this yeah. defense is, is in my mind, and I think I'm right, is automatically better this year. And so now we see, we start to talk about, you know, what, um, you know, what do we do? Uh, Kelly says, uh, if the Oilers are relying on a 20 year rookie at any position next season, that's a problem. I, well, I don't know if relying would be the right the word there. I don't, I don't think that they need to rely on any player. I think the the fact is they're relying on the guys like dry McDavid, Nuge, um, and, and those guys, they're relying on them to continue to do what they do and they're filling in the other roles. So I don't know that I'd, I'd say that they're relying on them. What I'm saying is that they can add these players maybe at lower risk than another team could add those players because they don't have the same superstar talent that the Oilers have. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, if you get a chance, uh, read that article, Positional Asymmetry on the Oilers Part 1. Uh, QR code's there. Uh, we've got, uh, we're already at an hour and a half uh, tonight. We'll get uh, quickly, um, the, the last article was the Connor Brown article. Uh, that's um, Eric Friesen kind of tidied that one up nicely. Uh, he talks about um, Friedman uh, mentioning um, Connor Brown on uh, 32 Thoughts. And, you know, if, if the wind is blowing a certain way, uh, Friedman knows as well as anybody. So uh, that's that's good. 
by the way, lots break says part two is coming up right away. Another uh, article I'm putting up the QR code for this also is on a heavy hockey site is the Oilers cap situation entering summer 2023. Again, great work by uh, Lotzi. Uh, please have a read. Talks about some of the things. A name that we haven't talked about at all tonight is Janmark. So, you know, I mean, there's a guy that, um, you know, I, we'll see. I mean, he, he's, uh, he's going to test the market, but um, sometimes these guys come back, right? Like they come yeah. back and, um, you know, and Kane did it. Yeah. So he, you know, he'd be, um, I think he was, an, you know, turned out to be, I thought he had a, a slow start at the, um, at the a slow start at the beginning of the season. Uh, but he became, he became the player. I think we hoped he'd be by the end of the season. In fact, I, I found myself becoming a pretty big Yanmark fan, although I'm sure I could mm-hmm. probably, if I looked at some recordings, there's probably some nights where I was yelling and screaming at him. But uh, okay, so let let's just uh, finish this off uh, with the part that we were going to do before we talked about the articles, which is um, you know uh, maybe just a quick who's in, who's out for you, and who's in, who's out for me. Uh, you know what? I will start. I'll say my final words, uh, and then you can uh, finish us off with uh, your who's in, who's out, and uh, say good night to, to everybody. How's that work? Perfect. All right. All right. All right. Uh, and uh, yeah, just thank you to everybody who tuned in. Uh, good crowd tonight. Uh, Kelly, always good to see you. Lotsy. Uh, yeah, you nice know, to see Kelly. Lotsy, I. Uh, I read uh, read all your articles. It's nice to see you supporting me for a change. <laughs> you know, so good to good to have you on here. Uh, and proof, though, that I do read your articles. Um, so it's all good. Uh, as far as the Oilers are concerned, um, you know, and, and we talked about this article with, um, you know, about Lotsy writing about that as in the right wing. Everybody knows that's a problem. Uh, you know, it's. Um, it's clear. It's identifiable. Uh, it's actually maybe one of the things for me when I look at this team and I think, look, like, you know, sometimes there, sometimes teams don't know what they need to do. But the Oilers, I think, have a pretty easy blueprint going into this offseason. Like, it's not, you know, there's no questions to me as to what they need to do. They need to find some right-wing talent. Uh, to fill out sort of the bottom half of the of the lineup, and they need to do it at a cheap price. And so, you know, it narrows the list down of potentials. That's why Connor Brown's in that list. That's, you know, uh, the discussion around some of these folks. Um, I, I don't love the, uh, maybe the thought that they're not going to sign. And, and look, Colin didn't say they wouldn't sign him by July 1st. He just seemed to, suggests that it wasn't as big a deal to him and maybe it's not maybe you know maybe dash is 100 percent right and they you know they know that the deal is going to come and and uh, we'll see but i do expect bouchard on this oilers team i don't expect an offer sheet uh i don't expect much to change in terms of if i start with the d uh in terms of the top uh, six on the oilers defense this year i just don't think that it there's much they can do. I think CC is going to be back. I think we might see Broberg gone. Uh, that's the most likely thing. And, and maybe just some touch-ups there on D. Biggest changes uh, this year that um, we'll see, obviously, are going to be on the forward core. Uh, you've got Bugstad, uh, Shore, and Janmark that are all UFAs uh, going into July 1st. Um, I doubt we'll see Janmark back although you know we could see him on a um on a on a low dollar contract and you know i i would be all right with that uh it sounds to me um uh, from what i've heard that shore is maybe another guy that's likely to benefit from the oilers cap situation and and make his way back on the team again this year and so i'm not going to be surprised if we see him uh bukestad i just don't see that happening i think somebody will pick him up for a couple more dollars than the Oilers can afford, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, and then Costin, um, I'm less likely to think 
Costin's a sure thing. Uh, but, um, it, but, uh, you know, to all those points we've talked about, you know, I think I really do believe he loved uh, playing in Edmonton. Um, and I think he's, you know, his best opportunity is to at least stick it out one more year and maybe uh, stay on a value contract to make it work and then um, sign somewhere big. Or again, with the Oilers, if it works out the following season, uh, I think he's got a good opportunity on the Oilers. Um, McLeod, uh, you know, obviously, uh, arbitration eligible. Um, you know, I, I can't even tell what's going to happen on there. Uh, Kelly says, Gregor said, sure. And Bukes for that are gone. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of figured Shore would be back, but maybe that's possible. Gregor knows probably has a better insight than I do. Uh, Lavoie, obviously, they'll they'll sign. Um, anyway, those those are the guys that I see. I mean, you know, Holloway, I think will make a step up. I'm I, I'm not as convinced on him this year as I was last year. Um, you know, now it's kind of you had your chance and. You know, now you've really got to show something. So we'll see as um, as camp goes on. Uh, I'm excited, though, you know, for uh, all those guys like Holloway, like Lavoie, like, um, you know, Borgo, if he, you know, it doesn't end up a trade piece. Uh, those guys all have this is this should be an exciting year for them. Like if you talk about motivation to start working out for the upcoming season this might be the best year to make the Oilers as a forward that has ever mm -hmm. been like to be a, to be a rookie, to be one of those rookies, you know, that we're talking about this year, this is maybe the best year. So those are the things. And then, um, you know, I think uh, McLennan was talking about the Oilers needing some, uh, some goaltending, but I just, the goaltending is not going to change. So if you're hoping that it's going to change, um, I, I, anything short of a miracle Campbell and Skinner are, are the guys um, going oh, yeah. into next year. So that's all I see. Uh, thanks again to everybody. I am, uh, I'm going to be off next week, but uh, I'm going to talk dash into trying to host the show. Um, so appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and uh, stay the extra. Usually dash only talks for an extra 20 uh so if you can <laughs> if you can bear with them uh say that and uh for me to you uh good night make sure you check out heavyhockey.com oh, oh and last thing i gotta say this before i give away my uh my time on the microphone um it's a shame what happened to the folks over at 1260 i mean this is um you know the same thing happened only days earlier with the athletic and some really good writers uh, across the board there. Uh, look, um, you know, the corporate world is that way, right? People lose their jobs every day. Uh, it's a little different in the media world because you listen and hear these guys all the time. So you kind of feel a little bit more connected to them. Uh, but here's the thing that I think um, the opportunities are big for all those very, very talented guys uh, whether it's Dusty or Low Tide or Gregor or Strudwick. And um, obviously those guys aren't going to be gone for long. Um, and, I, and I suspect that um, while they might not see it, sometimes uh, usually it turns out to be a better thing for them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as far as Oilers fans are concerned, um, you know, we'd love to be listening to those guys on a day-to-day -day basis, and we just can't right now. And so, um, although some of them have podcasts already, I think, and, and that sort of thing, but anyway, it's a shame, um, man, for me to those guys, if they ever do tune in. And I think on occasion, we've had a couple of them tune in, um, you know, I just want to say, uh, I, I, listening to 1260 and I did it here from uh, Nova Scotia all the time. It was a great thing. So my hat's off to those guys and I know they'll, uh, do bigger and better things wherever they um, they end up. And they're always welcome on heavy hockey, of course. <laughs> All right, Dash, you're up. Thanks, brother. Uh, I think you're just lucky. If you want me to make this short, that Beer League hero and uh, our good friend Kelly didn't ask for story time again. Uh, we all know how much Kelly loves story time with Dash. 
baby. But but I'll save it. Um, if he tunes in next week and lets me know he's going to be watching, I'll uh, I'll try to drum one up when I'm hosting. Uh, love the opportunity and would appreciate it. So tune in next week and uh, we'll try to put something on the air for you guys. Uh, the only caveat is that Michael agreed before the show that if I did do that, that he would stop calling me his almost co-host and actually admit to me being his associate host. Uh, 1260. Yeah, I, there's just a hole in my heart. Um, I know we'll see those guys again. There's no doubt in my mind. I've, I've already heard Dreger say that, you know, him and Struddy and Connor will be back and, you know, Dusty's putting out tweets with, you know, fist bumps and, and clearly there's some things in the works, uh, whether it's independent podcasting, streaming, whether they end up, uh, Sportsnet ends up buying the building and comes in and makes the fan 1260, I guess we'll, we'll, uh, have to see, but I do want to say that, you know, nobody loves losing their job. Uh, that's not easy for anybody to go through. That's a hard day. Uh, a lot of those guys have been through hardships and had losses recently. So my heart did go out to them, but mostly I'm just like selfishly crying on the inside because I miss it so much. I rushed to the radio on Monday morning to listen to Rashad at 830 and, like, you know, went to go tune in and went, oh man. So, uh, yeah, there, there's definitely some things missing there. You wanted me to go all into who's going to be back and who's not. Ultimately, I think we touched on it, Michael. I, I think um, I made it pretty clear. Connor Brown will be here. <clears throat> uh, I would love to see another defenseman brought in if Robert goes. I would love to, to be somebody like Mayfield that has some, you know, top two, top four solidity that's played against a lot of uh, other players, best players. Uh, I think we'll see Costin back. I think we will uh, obviously see Bouchard back. Uh, McLeod, I think, will be re-signed. Uh, I don't see Bugstad. I don't see Shore. I don't see any of those players coming. And ultimately, this is going to be probably one of the most boring off-seasons we'll ever see. Connor Brown is probably far and away the biggest player, and I think he's like 40th on the free agent list. So um, that's all that's happening because that's all we have the room to do. And ultimately, I think it is best for us to keep our powder dry and make a trade at the trade deadline when we know exactly what we need, when we know what injuries are there, and when we know exactly uh, what the secret ingredient might be to get to the finish, just like we did with that home this year. So uh, I wouldn't get too excited about anything else happening, uh, Oilers-wise, but uh, you can get excited and tune in to us every Tuesday. And uh, we will always love to see you here. Good night for now.